So why did your cloud architecture fail? There are three common reasons that you should know about. Yeah! Welcome to the Cloud Computing Insider, where we talk about the realities of cloud computing and generative AI. I'm your host, Dave Linthicum, author, speaker, b Geek, and here today to tell you about the realities of cloud computing. First, thanks to everybody who watched the last video. It got a lot of views, and uh, it was really uh, heartwarming to see everybody react to it in a positive way. Obviously, a little bit controversial, even though I don't think it is controversial. If you think about it, at the end of the day, we're just learning about the different options that we have for deploying our applications and our data sets, either on cloud or not cloud. And the reality is that's going to change in terms of best practices over time. And there are certain benefits and certain downsides of each. And the, the idea here is that we're going to teach you what those are. So you can make your own decisions. This is not about uh, becoming an activist around cloud computing or an activist uh, against cloud computing. There seems to be a lot of that out there. This is about looking at the technology and the realities, what other people are doing and how to leverage the technology most effectively. So keep that in mind as you watch my videos. So let's talk today about the uh, three most common reasons why cloud computing architectures fail. Uh, and I've wrote about this a ton of times and uh, certainly speak about this a ton of times, either in my InfoWorld uh, blog or, or in my last book, Cloud, uh, uh, The Insider's Guide to Cloud Computing. And I think that in 2024, we are reflecting back on the under-optimization of the platforms that we're leveraging now, which are namely being tagged because of the expense. In other words, people are paying way more for cloud computing than they thought they were. We talked about that in the last video. And the majority of reasons why they're doing that are going to be mostly self-inflicted. So again, it's not the fault of the cloud provider. They're providing the service and with the agreed upon price that they decided to provide. It's ultimately you made uh, non-optimal decisions in picking the platforms and then picking the ways in which, you were, in which you want to deploy your applications and your data sets. And so that's why most cloud architectures fail. By the way, this doesn't mean that they didn't work. Everything that we build out there on cloud or non-cloud can be made to work. This is about optimization of those platforms. And normally people spending 10 times as much as they should be spending on those platforms to run the same applications and data sets. So let's talk about why your cloud architecture fails. So first and foremost, and by far the most common mistake that I see people making out there are going to be bias-led decisions. And we all know what these are. In other words, you get into an organization they're only using Amazon Web Services, they're only using Microsoft, they're only using Google, or they're not using any of those three. And so in other words, they have set biases or set expectations that the company has or the people who are designing the system have before they set out to make objective decisions in terms of what platforms they need to leverage to build something that's gonna be optimized for the business. And so this is a huge issue now because people have a tendency to build infrastructure around particular brands, AWS, Microsoft, Google, uh, any number of things. And the reality is that's not always going to be the right fit for every application and every data set out there. And so your ability to open up your mind and expand to you look at different cloud providers, different cloud services, even some of the on-premise alternatives that are there, are gonna lead you to a much better chance of having an optimized solution. And so we also know that uh, architects have these biases. Uh, we all have biases as human beings. It's just the nature, that's, that's the nature of us being human. Uh, so we need to learn to get around them and start asking questions in terms of what other options do we have that are going to provide uh, better capabilities, better efficiencies, for the platforms that we need to run our applications and data sets. And now we have the opportunity to uh, to do this again. We're moving into generative AI. Most of you who are listening to this video have some generative AI plans of some sort within your business. And now we're gonna have to select platforms to run these things. Obviously cloud computing is probably the most convenient way to do it, but which cloud, which system, um, you know, which uh, development tools, uh, which AI tuning tools you need to leverage. All these decisions need to be made. And if we're just focused around one particular brand, uh, because 
we have people who are skilled in that particular brand, then the likelihood is that we're going to make an under-optimization mistake. In other words, we're going to pick a technology solution which is not able to live up to the, the value expectations of the business, therefore not return as much value to the business as it should, and that's going to be a failure. So don't do that. Don't be biased. Open up your mind to other alternatives and options and looking at cloud-based solutions and also non-cloud-based solutions. Next would be not considering the costs of operational complexity. Uh, this is the reality that we're building systems in many instances, many occasions that are too complex unto themselves. And the reason we're doing this is because we're picking best of breed technology solutions. Therefore, whatever technology we need to leverage and that's determined within the, the development pod that's building and deploying these systems, that's the one they're going to go with. So you end up with uh, 20 different databases. You end up with um, 15 different operating systems and uh, you know uh, 10 different types of processors, CPUs, GPUs, TPUs, for an example. And this drives heterogeneity, which is fine, certainly if we're going to live up to uh, the best of breed rule where we're picking technology that's going to bring the most value back to the business, thus best of breed. We need to consider the operational complexity that comes along with that. That doesn't mean that we don't pick uh, heterogeneous solutions, um, and that means that we don't uh, preclude that we preclude solutions that we don't we, we count things out. It just means that we have to understand that we have to put this into an operational state, and we need a mechanism. We need an approach to deal with the operational complexity. Now, normally, it's it's going to be abstraction and automation layers that sit across the various diverse technologies, um, super cloud, meta cloud come to mind, but AI ops, security managers, um, uh, operations tools that are able to span, span platforms. And thus we're not dealing with each platform and dealing with each application development environment on the terms of that technology. We're dealing with it on our own terms. In other words, we're looking for common systems that are able to run across these various dispersed systems and that are very heterogeneous. In other words, different brands, different types of technology, different databases, different security systems, things like that. But it actually, in this kind of approach, reduces the operational complexity because we're moving, removing the amount of complexity that the human beings and that the common management processes need to see because we're dealing through a single interface and therefore, we're dealing with security through one common mechanism, operations through one common mechanism, application development through one common mechanism. And we're able to, by doing this, allow us to exist with operational complexity, but do so in a way where we're able to run this in an efficient state. So in other words, it's not going to bog us down with having to hire you know, 20 different types of talent to, to maintain the 20 different uh, platforms that we have within the system. We do so through a common mechanism. We do so, do so through a common way. That's the best approach to do this. Finally, and most importantly, not considering security as a systemic design consideration. People have a tendency, and certainly this is the case with cloud architectures, to start thinking about security as the last step. So in other words, they, they build, they design the application, they build the application, they deploy the application, they put it into an operational state, and normally security comes as an afterthought. So they're thinking about encryption, they're thinking about identity access management, all these sorts of things which are going to be retrofitted at the end of the architectural process. That's absolutely not what you need to do. Security needs to be systemic to the design decisions that you're making, to development of the applications and the data sets, to picking the platforms you're going to leverage, to picking the network systems you're going to leverage. And by doing that, we're engineering the applications and we're engineering the data sets to make the most of the security technology that we're leveraging. Also, we're able to make better decisions about the security technology because we're custom picking a bespoke security solution for this particular works workload and also this particular platform where it's going to run upon. Now, again, back to the operational complexity, what you don't want to do is start binding uh, a variety of different security solutions to every application and data set out there. We are looking for some commonality. What I'm saying here is that the security hooks, the interfaces need to be engineered into your cloud solutions. And, and if you're not doing that, 
you're going to try to add it as a less last step, and you're going to make pro you're going to make that application much more vulnerable. Uh, it's going to amplify that mistake. So, don't be the architect that picks security as the last step, but thinks about how we're dealing with security throughout the entire architectural process. You'll be glad you did. Well, that's all I have for you today. Make sure to like and subscribe. Also, watch the other videos. I think you'll enjoy those. Watch the shorts. Uh, check out my book, Insider's Guide to Cloud Computing. Read my InfoWorld blog. And also my LinkedIn Learning courses out there. I have 72 cloud-based courses on LinkedIn Learning. If you want to learn about cloud computing, either enhancing your skills or gaining the cloud skills you need to get a job, check those out. I'm, you'll, I'm going to be happy that you did.